Okay, so today we are talking about library resources and a few other resources um, for your creative practice. And um, so just a quick introduction. My name is Corey Budden. I am a librarian here at UMA. And um, I do also try and do some creative things on the on my free time on the side and I make music and sometimes I draw and, and make scenes. So um, this session is just meant to highlight resources the library has to offer you with all those types of creative practices. Um, and when we think about creative practices, it can mean, you know, your studies here at UMA, um, or it can also just mean, again, like what I mentioned, sort of those extra creative pursuits that you have for school or things that you might do for fun. Um, so uh, our agenda for today is uh, we're going to discuss the ways in which the library can foster creative inspiration, uh, showcase some databases and research methods and websites that can help uh, or that can be catalysts for your creative practices. And um, yeah. Uh, and then first, I guess I'm just curious um, if we anyone has sort of a daily inspiration um, strategy, like do you have particular um, platforms or methods um, or even people that you go to for inspiration? Is this like an open question? Like, yeah, I yeah. Um, yeah, so um, a lot of times where I get inspiration ends up being like walking in the woods, which of course we have a lot of in Maine, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, but that was a lot harder when I wasn't living like in the woods. Um, so yeah, a lot of, a lot of my time is like when I'm doing something that doesn't, and like, doesn't take a ton of brain space. So like woods walks are awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, also a lot of times I get like really good ideas, maybe on a car ride, like highway driving. So another kind of thing that doesn't take a ton of focus kind of lets my mind wander. I know some, some people shower thoughts, right? Um, <laughs> usually I'm just oh, I'm gotta get to bed or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, but for me, it's kind of those like calming, um, brain free moments where I get to kind of just not think too much. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. I feel the same way. Like I go in the woods if um for inspiration or um definitely this idea of like letting your mind wander is so important. Um and I am actually gonna talk about that in a little bit. So that was a great uh transition. <laughs> um so thank you for that. Uh so yeah, um, and I know it might not seem completely obvious at times that um, the artists have actually long drawn inspiration from the library um, and and it's kind of a thing. So I have some quotes from artists sort of giving testament to how libraries can inspire. And so one artist, Serena Corda, um, compares libraries with artists, commenting that both libraries and artists sort of pull and weave things together that don't seem completely connected. And through this process, both facilitate the creation of new, previously unthought things and ideas, uh, which I thought was a cool way of looking at it. And then another artist um, named uh, Laura Damon Moore said that uh, when I don't have a specific project that I'm working on, one of my favorite things to do is wander in a section of one of the libraries I frequent pull books off the shelf and page through them. Um, so there are lots of examples uh, beyond just sort of um, finding sort of inspiration in the library. Uh, there are also lots of examples out there of artists creating art in libraries or even using library materials to create installations and things like that. So if that's something you're interested in, I encourage you to, to look into that or reach out to me and I can send you some, some cool examples. Um, so just uh, I'm going to quickly talk more about what the library offers that can sort of help with creative practices. Um, the first three things I'm just going to quickly mention, and then we'll dive more deeply into um, four, five, and six. So first, we do offer what we call a collaboratory in Kate's Library in Augusta. So this is the space where you can use a 3D printer, a large format printer. Um, we also have 
virtual reality headsets there. Um, and we're always sort of working towards getting new equipment in there. So if you're interested in checking that out, you can actually, um, I'll show this in just a moment, but we do have a, um, a guide that will show you, um, let's see, how am I gonna get to it? There we go. Uh, do a new share real quick. There we go. Um, so this is sort of a guide to the collaboratory. You can get to it from our library homepage and it sort of outlines some of the equipment we offer um, and as well as the hours. So that's um, something you you might be interested in checking out um, in the in the future. And let's go back to our presentation here. So. Um, we also have equipment that you can check out. So um, uh, we have digital cameras. Um, we have a very limited amount of laptops, uh, headphones, so things to sort of, um, you know, get you started on working on projects. And then, of course, research help, you know, if there's a certain topic that maybe you're getting some inspiration from, but you want more information on, you can always work with a librarian uh, to sort of help you find sources on that. Um, but so now we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about some of the other things that we offer. So one of those things is just spaces. Um, and so I was sort of thinking about, like, what is special about a library space? And I had this thought that maybe um, libraries are a great way to sort of um, facilitate what's called a flow state. Um, so I have this kind of dense definition, which is that Flow is described as a state of optimal performance denoted by smooth and accurate performance with an acute absorption of <laughs> in the task to the point of time disassociation and disassociative tendencies. So what does that mean? Um, so that's when you're just basically like you're really in the zone. You're really focused and working on something that feels exciting and rewarding, while at the same time a little bit challenging. So it's when you're so focused that you can't, that you can tune out like your surroundings and you sort of also most importantly, maybe for some people is you uh, experience sort of a loss of feeling of self-consciousness. So I find when I'm sort of creating things that I often, if I'm thinking about it too much or if I'm not in that sort of flow state, I'm really overthinking things like, oh, this is so stupid. No one's gonna like this, whatever. Um, but when you're able to sort of get into that flow state, you're, those thoughts are not coming to you. You're sort of just excited about the work and making the work and not distracted by anything else. Um, and this can be really effective. Um, so researchers in this area of study feel that flow states are incredibly important states of being. And um, a 10 year longitudinal study found that people were 500% more productive in a flow state than when they were not in a flow state. Uh, and I think libraries are particularly conducive to fostering sort of our ability to get into a flow. And that's because we're offering you a space that's away from your daily distractions. It's beautiful, um, full of plants and books and art. Uh, so sort of similar to what you're talking about, Lindsay, like this idea of like going in the woods or on a drive and seeing, you know, beautiful things and sort of letting your mind wander. The library is a great space for that. Um, and libraries also have sort of quiet spaces, but we also have loud spaces. So if you um, want to work with someone, collaborate on something, we have spaces for that. Um, so there are lots of different ways that you can sort of utilize our spaces. And I think sort of getting, trying to get into that flow state is, is one possibility. Um, so the other thing we have are books. <laughs> um, and what I think is really cool and what some of those quotes I mentioned earlier, um, we're getting that is this idea of serendipitous browsing. So that's one of my favorite library phrases, serendipitous browsing. And what it means is when you're sort of wandering the library shelves in a way that is, quote, wholly random, unstructured, and undirected. And what this can do is lead you to books or materials that you didn't know you wanted to look at until it was there in front of you. Um, and it's also a, a great way to find books uh, that are related to your topic, but for whatever reason, maybe didn't come up when you searched our catalog, but they're just sort of there on the shelf for you. Um, and I love this quote from an article by Boyan Kim that says, uh, in the library stacks, we get to see the knowledge that is much bigger than us, taller than us, and wider than us. 
We do not experience the boredom and tediousness that we usually feel when we scroll up and down a very long list of databases and journals on a library webpage. We pause, we admire, and we look up and down. Uh, and that's just such a cool experience to have in a library. And um, this often can take us down some surprising and inspiring paths. Um, all that being said, you know, if you're unable to make it to the library, which not all of us can, uh, you can also sort of browse serendipitously online. Um, so I am going to kind of show you what that looks like really quick. And um, unfortunately, I'm having some Chrome issues, so I have to switch <laughs> to a different browser so that things load for me. Um, but here we are. Uh, so this is the library homepage, and um, this is the link to that collaboratory guide that I mentioned earlier. Um, but just to show you what it might look like to do a serendipitous browse uh, online is um, I might go to this library catalog link. Um, and then what you can do is sort of search kind of, a, you know, whatever topic comes to mind. So let's say I was interested in lightning. <laughs> um, and I searched lightning. And then um, what you might want to do after your initial search is uh, in your results page, you'll see on the left hand side, you can kind of filter things. And if you're sort of an online only person or um, only want to look through materials in the moment, you can actually use this UMA online filter in the library location section. And what that's going to do is it's going to show you all of the materials that we have available to you that are online. Um, and so let's say we're scrolling through this list and we see uh, this catching lightning with photography. That sounds kind of cool. Um, so I can click on it. And then I can see that um, it's a, a streaming film. Um, it's very short, which is nice. I can see it's two minutes long. That sounds great. And it gives me a little summary and some things I can do to kind of, um, even before I check out this video, to get some other ideas of what might else be out there. I can see my subject terms. So I've got art and architecture, photography, internet videos. So I can click these and it will take me to materials that have those same subject terms. So that would be a way to sort of dig through stuff that you don't really know what's gonna turn up for you. Uh, another thing you can do, so um, if we wanted to actually watch this video, we would click UMA access and it's gonna take us to the database that uh, this video lives in and we can watch it and I'm sure it's awesome. Uh, and then we can also look through what's in this database. So Films on Demand is maybe a database you don't interact with super often for class. Um, maybe it is, but if it's not, you can kind of explore it. So this video has all kinds of tags. So we've got daguerreotypes, which is the early form of photography, um, electric arcs, uh, physics. So all this cool stuff. And then also recommended videos. So, um, there's a video on magnetism, invisible fields of force, like all of this sounds very cool to me. <laughs> um, so you can sort of use the databases and the subject terms to uh, see what else we have available to you um, on uh, the databases that you wouldn't find by just sort of searching um, for a specific source. So um, going back to our presentation here, um, the other thing we have that are online uh, that you can utilize uh, are databases. So um, with databases, uh, I like to think of them as like another way to get sort of creative inspiration uh, by looking at other people's art. So sometimes I see a movie and I'm like, wow, that's amazing. It sort of inspires me in my own way or hear a song or look at a painting. So um we have some databases that can give you access to these types of materials to sort of get you inspired. Um, and so I have them kind of pre-populated in my other window here. Uh, but just so you are aware, um, you would get to the, any of our databases from the library homepage, you would just click this databases button. Uh, and then you see a full list and you can sort of search by um, the name of the database. You can also, um, I'll just show you really quick. You could search by the name, you can look by specific subjects, or if you're interested in a certain type of database or like certain type of material, such as images or um, streaming films or something, you can search by that. So uh, the first database I'd like to show you is 
one that will help you find um, films. So, and not just like uh, sort of may maybe a little dry educational type films, but like actual blockbuster movies um, that are really cool. So this is called Swank. Um, it, it's technically called Digital Campus Swank, but if you were to search in that um, database field I showed you and just typed in Swank, it would come right up. And you can see um, we've got everything everywhere all at once. A uh, huge movie last year. Um, this is one of my favorite sort of cult movies, but I'm a cheerleader. It's really funny. Um, so lots of just a huge variety of movies. And um, unfortunately, the interface to find movies on this uh, database is not amazing. But what you can do is search for specific titles. You can also um, search by category, um, such as recently watched. But I also sometimes when I don't totally know what I want to watch, I might go by filter and this actually gives you um, genre filters. So if I'm interested in like a comedy, I could search by comedy. If I'm interested in a scary movie, I can search by scary I don't think it says scary, probably says horror. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, crime, comedy, mystery. So yeah, horror. Um, so uh, that would be maybe a more effective way to sort of find um, a movie that you might want to watch in Swank. Uh, the other movie that we have is, uh, sorry, not movie. Um, the other database that might be fun um, is called Comics Plus. So again, you could um, go into our database list and search comic plus, it's all one word, um, and then you'd be able to access it. So the one sort of unique thing about comic plus is that you do need to sort of um, tell them what school you go to um, at first. So, if, and it comes up at the top, Augusta, University of Maine at Augusta. So I select that. And then you do need to enter your library card number. Um, which is the very bottom number on your student ID. Uh, if you don't have a student ID, you would just go to your UMA launch pad and click the UMA card tile in your launch pad. If any of this is um, confusing, just reach out to me and I'll show you. But to get to Comics Plus, um, you would select Augusta, University of Maine, Augusta, and then you would type in your library card, which I guess I'll uh, blur out in the recording, <laughs> um, but then you would log in uh, and um, of course it's a little slow, but here we go. So Comics Plus is awesome. Um, so you're going to first start out on our on the featured um, comics page, but they've got all kinds of titles. Um, and then you can also search, you know, by popular, you can search by category um, if you're looking for a specific um, type of comic or something specific, but there's all kinds of amazing stuff on here that is just fun to look at and kind of can kind of inspire your art. Um, similarly, we have uh, eBooks and audiobooks. So these are more, um, those like just for fun books more likely than, than school related um, titles. So this is in a database called Cloud Library. So again, I would just um, go to my databases page, type in cloud library. Again, it's one word for some reason. Um, and then I could access it through here. And this is another database where you would need that library card number. Um, but if you have any trouble finding that number, just reach out to me and I will get it to you. But uh, again, we've got um, an easy way to browse if you're not totally sure what you're looking for. Um, I would just click the browse button and then it's going to give you options for like adult fiction, nonfiction, teen fiction, and then you can kind of search um, by topic there. So that would be another way to access ebooks and, and audiobooks. And then finally, um, I want to show you a database where you can look at images of art. Um, and so this is called JSTOR. So I would go to my databases list and type in JSTOR and I would access it this way. And um, this is a database that has both um, journal articles as well as images. So if you're specifically looking for like images of art, you, you might wanna toggle over to images and then you could search for like an artist. Um, does anyone wanna offer maybe a semi-famous, they don't have super underground artists in here, but maybe like a famous artist that you can think of? Renoir. Renoir, sure, yeah. So let's type in 
Renoir, you're testing my spelling. <laughs> we'll see how I do. Yeah, I spelled it wrong. Um, or it's just, that's interesting. Oh, I must have spelled it wrong. O-I-R. 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 Thank you, Arthur. Um, where was I? That's also a good lesson. If you're ever searching in the library databases and you're like, how is there no results? Check your spelling. <laughs> um, okay, this looks more like it. So um, we can see images of Renoir's works um, from a bunch of different museums. Uh, and we can just sort of browse through these and see what sort of inspires us. And the cool thing about JSTOR too is that if there is an image that you um, really like, you can sort of uh, zoom in on it really. Um, it's, it's not working right now, of course, because I'm here live. Um, but <laughs> in theory, you would see the, the image I clicked on and be able to really zoom in. Um, you can also uh, start your own account with JSTOR. Um, and then you would just need to log in and you could save images um, for later reference. So they have what's called a workspace. So if you have an account with them, of course, it's not working. Uh, if you have an account with them, uh, you have your own workspace. So when you log into JSTOR, you could have all of your images that you've saved. You can organize them in different folders. Um, so this is a great way to sort of keep track of things. Um, and similar to sort of that idea of browsing and just seeing what strikes you, you can also browse images. So if I go to this browse drop down menu, I can specifically look for images, see if this loads. Yay. Um, so you can search within specific collections. You can search by geography. Um, classifications is similar to sub subject terms, like I mentioned before. So um, there are lots of ways to explore what's available in, in Art Store. Uh, so that would be another really fun database to sort of get a little lost in and, and see what's available to you. Um, oh, no worries, Arthur. I'm glad you're here. Um, Okay, so let's go back to the uh, presentation here. Um, so we talked a little bit about the library um, websites and what we have to offer. And uh, there's so much more there even than what I mentioned. Um, but I did wanna take some time to talk about some websites that might be available to you. Uh, so uh, one that I discovered, I think, maybe in 20, early 2023, um, is this website called same.energy, and that is the URL that you would put in, same.energy. And um, what it does is, um, yeah, I'm gonna have to share my other screen again. Okay, so this is essentially a database of images that allows you to search um, for similar images. So you can really go down a fun rabbit hole. So um, there's a search bar up at the top. Uh, you can also, I guess, in theory, paste an image and it will find like images for you. I've tried that and it didn't work for me. It said there was an error every time I tried, but you're welcome to try it. But so um, <laughs> the example I thought of was I really love Halloween uh, and I really love like sort of old Halloween like postcards and, and Hallmark cards and things. So I thought I would try vintage Halloween. So I'm um, just gonna see what comes up. And now I have all of these images that I'm like, oh, wow, cool. Uh, and what you can do is, um, so I very vid vividly remember getting this Halloween Happy Meal at McDonald's when I was little. So I'm very drawn to this image. <laughs> um, and so I can click it. And what it's going to do is then populate this images with the same kind of energy, like same aesthetic. So it's a really fun website to sort of see um, what all is out there. And um, you can, again, like search um, all kinds of things. And you'll notice, so if I click this really uh, cool drawing of this like witchy pumpkin lady, now I'm getting very similar types of images. So that's a, a really great website to kind of explore and just sort of dive down into uh, a number of rabbit holes. <laughs> um, and then the other uh, website I wanted to show you is called um, Public Domain Review. So I'll just, it's publicdomainreview.org. 
And what this website is, is it's a um, website that basically collects and um, does scholarship on things in the public domain. So um, those items in the public domain essentially mean that they don't have copyright associated with them anymore. So you're allowed to really do anything you want with things that are in the public domain. You can um, change them. You can use them for your own art. You can kind of remix and reuse them however you want. So um, the public domain review uh, will find things in the public domain and write about them. So here's the whole article about this really cool artist um, named Georgia Houghton and um, her work. You can also just look at image collections. Um, so if you go to collections, you can um, browse by the type of materials in the public domain. Um, you can also search by theme. Um, and so this is also a really cool resource to use um, to find things that you would even maybe want to use in your own work. Um, and that's totally fine. Uh, or you can like recreate them in some way. So um, public domain review is also a great resource. And then the other thing, um, one more thing I wanted to show you is um, is uh, Google uh, artificial intelligence sort of bot called Gemini, which can now generate images for you, um, as well as poems and stories and things like that. So just to show you an example, um, this is a, a prompt I did for Gemini. Um, and I should say too, so you, if you have a personal Gmail account, uh, you should be able to access Gemini. Uh, you cannot use your UMA account to, to access it because of um, some privacy issues, uh, which I'll, I'll go on, I'll explain in a moment. But um, if you have a personal Gmail account, you can just go to gemini.google.com and play around with it. Uh, so the prompt I gave Gemini was uh, create a watercolor image of a sunroom with lots of plants and the sun shining into the room. The room should have two comfortable chairs, a coffee table and a colorful rug. This is my deep winter sort of fantasy, I think. Um, and uh, so then it generated four different images um, with this uh, sort of vision. Um, so it's a really cool way to sort of like dream up different things, you know, um, and you could even then from there um, say, oh, no, I want like floral plants, not, you know, you know, or you could say I want um, whatever, I want a bright red rug, like you could then um, have it adjust the image as you want it to, uh, which is pretty fun. Um, and then, you know, uh, as of this moment, images made with generative AI do not have copyright um, because a, a bot essentially made it. So I, my understanding is you can use these however, however you want. It's best practice to say that it was generated with AI. Um, this is really new territory. So there's a lot of copyright litigation that's still sort of being figured out. Um, and uh, so that might not always be the case, but for now, it's like a really cool thing to play around with. Um, so the couple of caveats I just would say um, with with Gemini is just that, um, you know, it's so it a, an artist didn't make those images. Right. But it did. Gemini is essentially pulling from other people's images that are out on the Internet and sort of amalgamizing them into new images. So it is using other people's work, um, which there are a lot of lawsuits going around about this thing, you know, artists saying you used my work without my permission, my copyrighted work, and you're creating these new images with your AI um, algorithm. So there's that. And then the other thing I mentioned was the privacy. So um, both ChatGPT, which you may have also already heard of, and Gemini, which is Google's, um, it used to be called Bard. Uh, so we don't know what they do with the things that we prompt them with. Um, so I would just recommend that you don't put personal information into your AI prompts. Um, so <laughs> all those caveats aside, it's really fun <laughs> to um, play around with it just to see what different images you can create. And I have found with my interactions with both ChatGPT and um, Gemini is more that um, 
I never end up using what it gives me, but it really gets my brain going. It's an excellent brainstorming tool when you really are just like, I don't know. I don't know what to do. It can really just like get your gears um, turning. Uh, I've yet to find a result where I'm like, wow, like I want to use this as is. Um, so just sort of an interesting uh, creative exercise, I think, um, with Gemini or ChatGPT, and they they have their own image generators as well. Um, if you have any questions about the AI stuff um, in general, you can always ask me or the library. We um, are trying to stay on top of those things. Um, so yeah, that was my really short uh, intro to, to library databases for your creative practice. Um, if you have any questions, definitely feel free to reach out to me. If you have any ideas, I'd love to hear them. Um, yeah, I'm just curious. Are either of you going to try and explore some of these tools to for your inspiration?